we weren't going to start till you actually got quiet. <laughs> Sounds like we have to start. Um, Mark Dever, Capitol Hill Baptist Church, Southern Baptist Church. Uh, Crawford Loritz at um, uh, a Bible what was it? Fellowship, Fellowship Episcopal Church. F Fellowship Episcopal Church. I thought so. Fellowship Bible Church. Well, I wanted to no. Fellowship Bible Church, Southern Baptist Church, a Bible Church, uh, Redeemer Presbyterian Church, and we're here to talk about what the local church should look like. One thing I can tell you is that uh, it looks different. Uh, depending on how big it is, uh, how small it is, uh, it, the, the denominational tradition. But we are here, uh, we don't have a script, we don't have an interlocutor, we don't have somebody asking questions. We're going to um, just interact with each other and talk about issues that not only uh, might divide us and unite us, and therefore that would probably be instructed to you. In other words, when you see commonalities and we, when you see us disagreeing or pushing back, that helps you say, I think, uh, here's, uh, here, are the, here are the things that probably we all have to agree on as this is the job of the local church, and here are places where there really is uh, room for difference. So um, let me start this way. You know, of the three of us, uh, Mark Dever and the Nine Marks uh, Ministries, uh, Mark spent more time writing about and talking about what the local church should look like. Therefore, I'm going to start with you. And um, run, down my nine, run down the nine marks. I'm not sure everybody here would have them memorized. Well, I, I want to be clear first that what I don't mean by this or what we usually mean in theology by the, mar the marks of a church. The marks of a church, I assume we would all agree, be the right preaching of the Word of God and the right administration of baptism and the Lord's Supper. So I, I assume we've got some agreements on that? Yeah? Yeah, the... Uh, our, for those of Presbyterians, some of you out there are saying, I thought that there was a third mark. We would say... Church discipline. Church discipline. I actually think that, personally, discipline and baptism and Lord's Supper are awfully, awfully linked. Yeah, I agree. There, that, I actually think it's, it's the preaching of the Word, the sound ministry of the Word, and then, actually, practice of biblical community, you could say, that there's, that there's a membership, that there's a, uh, there's standards for entry, there's a reason why someone can be taken out and dismissed. So it's, it's not just preaching the word. It's also uh, biblical standards for Christian community. Yeah. And you, at a Bible church, Crawford, you guys wouldn't have official membership, would you? Yes, we do. Because we feel that membership means something. It should mean something to identify with the local church. So we've strengthened that. Now, typically, a lot of Bible churches that's don't do that. That's what I was thinking. But we, we, um, we feel like... Community means something, and to be held in an accountable relationship means that uh, membership should be uh, underscored and heightened. So we do. So we're in agreement on that, even though we might name them different or list them differently. And so by the nine marks, you're saying that's not... Yeah, by saying. the nine marks, I, I always refer to them as just nine marks of a healthy church. I don't mean to suggest that they are the nine marks of a healthy church. They, they okay. are just nine marks of a healthy church. That's helpful to hear. Yeah. Um, yeah. Why well, you, that's the title of the book, you know, it's, Nine it, Marks of a Healthy Church. It doesn't say the nine marks. It doesn't. Well, you, gotta, you better watch your edit. You it's better not watch. like the Gospel Coalition. Yeah. <laughs> okay. By the way, next two years from now, you will be invited to a Gospel Coalition conference. <laughs> You know, we're laughing, but there actually is a very significant point in this that we all need to take, uh, I think we need to take note of. You know, sometimes we can principalize applicational stuff, and we can, we can make someone else's order be the standard for everybody else. And I think that's the problem with coming to events like this or conferences, where you end up, uh, you know, plugging and playing stuff without critically thinking through, well, what is essence and what is applicational and what is transferable and what is not? Well, if somebody's been hugely influenced by Crawford or Tim or Lloyd-Jones or John MacArthur, then they tend to think this is what ministry is. And, of course, MacArthur and Lloyd-Jones and Crawford and Tim, of all people know, will know that's not right. You know, but that's, that, that is a natural thing that happens. For example, just a second, you said that John MacArthur might say your expository preaching isn't 
or you're not doing expository preaching as he defines it? Is that fair to... I thought we said that like backstage over there. It was backstage, and I'd like to know... Um, <laughs> okay, John, listen. Uh, I'm not sure you've ever said that to me, but, um, you know, it's... I don't mean to... I, I, I certainly have had people represent that that would be his kind of take. Because I don't well, do what we saw James do today, going through Psalm 25, literally just verse right. by verse talking about it. In my sermon, if I have a really short text, I'll do that, but I'll often take a slightly longer text. So I think that's all. Now, I, 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 listen, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I know what you mean. There are plenty of folks, whether John would say this or not, but there are plenty of folks who would say, unless you're going verse by verse, you're not doing. Yeah. There's a fair, um, which, which I guess is my question to you about A9 marks or nine marks. Excuse it just me. works. I have to no, be really careful now. No article in front of it, it works. Okay, nine marks. And that is that sometimes I have people go, they, they absolutely love the nine marks, and they say this is incredibly great. Then they seem to, uh, the way which they practice it uh, indicates to me that they, that when they read expository preaching, when they read these various uh, uh, things, they they come out on the other side a little on the rigid side to me. In other words, they, there's, that, this means there's only one way of doing biblical evangelism, only one way of doing this or that. And when I've read your, at least the basic little book, it seemed to me there was a lot of flex there. Yeah. So it's, it's natural, especially for younger leaders, uh, to have in their mind something they want to do anyway. They read a book and they see it as a warrant for that when the book actually was an encouragement but didn't necessarily... Uh, tie you down to that level of detail. Yeah. I think the book was mainly uh, aimed at American evangelicalism. So rather than it being a sort of general ecclesiology, uh, it was a particular prescription for uh, the setting that, that American evangelical churches are in. Yeah. So just to, to review, uh, nine marks of a healthy church that I suggested are one, expositional preaching, kind of where it begins, two, biblical theology, Biblical understanding of the gospel, conversion, evangelism, uh, membership, discipline, leadership, and uh, desire or biblical understanding of discipleship and growth. How does that relate to the classic marks? It does somewhat. It does a little bit. Um, and I talk about that in the introduction. The, the preaching of the word, obviously, is yeah. the first three of those, really three or four. And then the rest of them are uh, sort of the encapsulating of it, as you put it, in the community. How do you def do you mind? How do you define expository preaching? The point of the you. passage is the point of the message. I need some more unpacking for. I mean, what, Crawford, what would you add to that? I, I would say, I would say yes to that, and I do have a pretty broad definition of exposition. Some people, for example, would say that. Uh, to preach topically is not exposition, not necessarily so. You can do topical exposition as long as it's the explanation of the text applied to the topic that honors the author's intent, the literal historical grammatical framework. But the way you go about explaining that could be varied. However, I need some more unpacking just to summarize the principle of the text is not necessarily exposition. Um, if, if I'm coming to the, to the sermon prep time, sort of a blank slate about the particular passage, uh -huh. you know, I've read it, I believe it, but I haven't really tried to think about what I would do in the sermon. So I'm not looking at a passage for divorce. I'm not looking at a passage for, you know, the church, the doctrine of the church. I'm really just coming to whatever is here in this chapter of, uh, of Ephesians I want to preach, or these verses in Mark's gospel, or this psalm. If I study that and I try to weigh it up and reflect and consult and decide that, look, this is what this passage is saying, and then I try to give that in the sermon, I think that's an exposition. I could be wrong or, or right in how I do it. So, but, I think, but you're saying as long as it's a summary, it's the statement that summarizes the exegesis and the insights into the passage and in that sense, it's true to the text, so then therefore it's explanation. And I'm preaching on it because that is what this text is about. Gotcha. Good. Uh, I would agree. Uh, you, do you remember a, a, a crazy series that you did in which you preached one sermon on every book of the Bible? Well, I, did, I broke it up over some times, but yeah, I did like the Minor Prophets is a 13-week series, and a year or two later I did the Gospels. And but I mean like one sermon on Luke. 
Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah, you did that. And I think those That's, were expositional messages. That was very manly of you. Well. <laughs> Every once in a while, Tim. Right, what a, yeah. what a, what a preaching mensch. <laughs> However, I appreciate that coming from the Garrison Keeler of American well, Evangelicalism. Thank you very much. <laughs> That warm, inviting baritone and wonderful narrative well, style what's <laughs> just makes me want to pull up around the radio in the Sunday afternoon and have a listen. This is what you call theological slinging. That's right. Oh, I, I, I love it. Well, the, the, uh, the verse, so, well, I think that's intriguing. You would saw that's a, if you preach one sermon on the book of Luke, and you are trying to, you read the book of Luke and you say, what are the main things that Luke is trying to say? And I make those the points of my sermon. That's an expositional sermon. You know, clearly you're not going verse by verse. Exactly. I think it's harder to do the more you get off a natural pericope for whatever that genre is. So for a psalm, I think I could preach a truly expositional sermon on one word. I think it'd be difficult to do it well. It'd be easiest to do the way James did going through the whole psalm. But I think it's possible to do it in the same way the whole book of Habakkuk. I think you can preach legitimately as one sermon, or even Isaiah. Right. I think it's harder to do that, but I think you can. And by the way, you, uh, would you press, I, I, I'll, sh I'll get back to where I, how I think this affects the local church, but for a minute, I know this wasn't supposed to be a talk on preaching, but I don't think you all care, do you? Uh, the, um, is it, you, you wouldn't say, do you believe that every passage of scripture has one main point that the author, the big idea that the author of the, uh, of the text is trying to get across. By the way, just a hint, I don't actually, but yeah. I just thought you might. So when you say the point of the sermon uh, yeah. is the point of the text, I, of, I often say, gosh, there's some, there are several points here. I'm not sure that I have to preach every one of them every time. And I'm not sure I know even which one in Luke's mind was the most important point of this text, but yeah, that, which I, also I think gives a certain amount of leeway as to what, as how you preach. Yeah, no, I, th I think I agree with you. Although I do think if we're doing our job well as exegetes, three agnostics looking at the same passage should be able to say really helpful things to us about the passage. I think that, I think that the, the scripture is perspicuous right. enough. It's reasonable communication. It's clear enough that we should be able to okay, actually argue between people what is the point of this passage. Then, uh, if one of the marks of the local church would be expository preaching, but we've just defined, or you've helped me, or we've just defined it, I think. Are you okay with everything he just said, uh, Crawford? Would you rather? Uh, it, it's in the ballpark. I, I would. I, you didn't I, like the idea of the agnostics preaching at church? No, no, I. Yeah. <laughs> No, I don't have agnostics preaching in my church either. No, no we yeah. rarely do that. Very yeah, rarely. I'm preaching. <laughs> <laughs> Cameras are rolling. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm preaching through James right now, and I, you know, this is this is where it, James is a challenge to big idea preaching. It's a challenge to it because it's it's like a it's like a running email to your kids in college, and you have different issues that keep popping up. Same thing with the first John. I mean, some of these oh, things are... I think so first John I may think, be one of the hardest. I think, what, I think what we need to be careful of, this gets back to my point, what we need to be careful of is, is settling on something that paints us in a corner and causes us to typecast our approach to all things, where we've got to be a servant of the Scriptures, and you've, you've, got, to, you've, you've got to give what the Scriptures give to you. My illustration is like a great, great batter's Great batters, I love baseball. Great batters don't have holes in their swings, and the guys that make it in the Hall of Fame can hit the ball where it's pitched. And one of the problems I find with younger preachers or preachers that get locked into a particular approach is that of necessity, that one size fits all, and they force the text into that template rather than sitting back and, and, and giving what, what the text gives, even in terms of structure, the suggested structure of your message should be should should come out of that. I'm not saying totally, but you you and that to me that's true exposition. Okay, yeah, and also try to find the, the big idea in Proverbs 11. I double dare you. Yeah. I, though, 
So have you preached a series through the Proverbs, Tim? I did. But you know what I did? I, uh, and actually I've... You just showed how we don't fulfill any of this and it's all fulfilled in Christ. <laughs> I, <laughs> what I did was, I, I, there's, there's really two ways to preach Proverbs, I think. One is, is you do it thematically. So what does Proverbs say about the poor? What does Proverbs say about the family? What does Proverbs say about work? Um, and, but Don Carson actually pushed back a little bit on me and said, however, it's, if you actually go through chapter by chapter, you'll see that there are, um, there are some themes inside the chapter. In other words, the, one chapter will actually have a fair number of things about one subject. Um, and therefore, if you do it that way, you miss it too. Well, you've also got uh, what I've done. I've done, I think, two series in Proverbs. One I did thematically, kind of Derek Kidner, you know, in the right. Tyndale Old Testament commentary. He does a great job in his intro. It's, yeah. So I, I, I did that for the chapters 10 to the beginning of 31. But I came back just a couple of years ago, actually, and did chapters 1 to 9 and 31 then consecutively. Right. Well, now, all I'm trying... I bet you, if you're out there listening, you may say, okay, so what is expository preaching? I, this sounds strange. I know when I, when I hear it's opposite, I know it. Yeah. When I hear someone not serious about the text, clearly has a bee in his bonnet or her bonnet and wants to just uh, basically spring off of some, some trope or some image or something in the text. And it's very, very clear to see that the person is using the scripture to ride a hobby horse or to make comments and is not actually saying, I'm under the authority of the scripture and I'm bringing you what the scripture says today, not what I say. That, that would be one of the most dispiriting things for me in ministry because one of the most encouraging is act, the actual preparation of the sermon. Because when I go to work on the sermon, I don't have in mind what I'm trying to get out of it. I mean, I have a rough idea, you know, especially if it's a smaller text, of, of what the point is going to be. We've had to, to look at that ahead of time to come up with the service, the hymns, and the scripture readings. But uh, I am refreshed, deeply refreshed, by being uh, weekly confronted by the Word in my study uh, in a way that I think has to be one of the best things about being a pastor. Yeah, you know, this triggers a thought in my mind, is that uh, one, one of the things that I think causes preachers to be effective and others to be ineffective is their confidence in the power of that word. You know, and I think, I think from a visceral perspective, that's what exposition does to you. That you stand behind that book and you open your mouth, and I'm not talking about volume or emotions, but you open your mouth and you preach with Holy Ghost certainty. And that's where you need to stand behind the text. And part of, part of my struggle with this whole thing that we've been going through the last 15, 20 years, um, where we flirted with audience dynamics and we flirted with, uh, um, you know, having to close with the audience on the message and trying to figure out whether we want to be preachers or communicators or Christian communicators or what, what, whatever all that means, is that what has been lost has been the, the holy confidence and that word from God for that people at that moment in history that's delivered with a laser beam focus. And I think when you stand as a servant of the scriptures and you stand understanding that on your face before God in your study, you have poured over that text and God has spoken and God has something to say to this, these people at this moment in history. To me, that, that rounds out the case for exposition. I, the um, the reason I'm and I want to move on to biblical evangelism. I'm actually going to keep going to a couple of the biblical marks of a church, or the, the nine, uh, eight, never mind, <laughs> nine marks of a church, because I think they're they're trying to call the local church back to some basics, uh, and yet I'm trying to I think make the case that well, they're still allow uh, we're still allowing a certain amount of flexibility. Uh, has to do with the culture and the temperament of people with, the, the, well, with regard to those basics. They're basics that aren't meant to be tied to any product from nine marks, the organization, yeah. Oh, yeah. or any publisher. Nobody's trying to make money off of it. This is just, yeah. there are things that nobody has an interest in really promoting. And so as pastors, we can get just awash sometime in a sea of mail of people kind of promoting things that they want money for. And, uh, and I'm not saying money is bad yeah. and you can't have a, you know, you can't charge for a conference. It's perfectly fine that we charge for Gospel Coalition. There are costs entailed in it. But, 
but there are, there are things as pastors that we need to do that it's in nobody's financial interest to remind us of. Yeah. And these, I just fear, are some of those things. Right. I, to, to clo- I think I'm going to try to finish up on, on the preaching, but I, um, a thought was that there, is a, there has been a lot of talk about dialogical preaching or, uh, well, there's plenty of people who think preaching's over. I was intrigued to read, uh, reread Martin Lloyd-Jones' Preaching and Preacher's book recently because Zondervan's putting it out again and some of us had a, our writing intros to it. And I was amazed at how farsighted he was. I mean, here's, a, here's an older man at the time, 1968, he was already 78 or something like that, I don't know. And, and he's in Britain, and he said, people have said preaching has had it, uh, that you no longer can pontificate, you, you need to have dialogue, you need to talk back and forth, you, you can't get up and say, thus saith the Lord. Uh, and... Um, uh, and yet, here's the dialogical side. I was recently listening to a series of sermons I did in the early days of my church. And um, on the one hand, there, there was a set of sermons on marriage. It was from Ephesians 5. On the one hand, they're very hard to transcribe. I've been trying to do that recently. And they're almost impossible to transcribe because they're so disorganized. Uh, and here's the reason why. I would do uh, week one. The next week, I would get up and I would say, after the service last week, a ton of you came up and asked me three, three, two or three questions, and I think you're right, but we need to, let, let, me, let me give you some good biblical answers to those questions. And I would give a code at a last week and, and say, uh, you're right, I didn't address that, but the text does address that. I would give two or three. Then I go about 15 minutes in and I say, now let's start subject two. Then when I got to the third week, I, the same thing would happen. I would say, a lot of you have been struggling with this thing I said, or a lot of you said this helped you, or you asked another question. So what eventually began happening was week four was a, a coded a week one and two and three, and then I would get to four, and, and, and yet the sermons ended up being powerful to the people hearing them, but it was a very communal experience. It was very clearly that people knew that I was speaking directly to the things that they were wrestling with. They would come up afterwards, I would talk, we would, we would just have just, uh, just talking after the services for 30 minutes to an hour with people who were most uh, questioning them. And there was absolutely a dialogical side to that that actually I'd, I have lost to some degree as the church has gotten bigger. And there's no reason why you can't have expositional preaching uh, and still, in a sense, up there uh, telling people what the Word of God is, and yet at the same time it would be deeply dialogical. Well, uh, you know, I would say that's preaching as a pastor. You know, yeah. one of the things I had to learn, I'm the rookie up here when it comes to pastors. I, I started five and a half years ago. I uh, spent 27 years traveling on the road. One of the things I had to come to grips with, and, and as you were sharing that, I, to me that's wonderful because I had to come to grips with it. There's a difference between preaching in an itinerant setting and at a conference and then preaching as a shepherd. Yes. Because your goal as a shepherd is to bring them the maturity in Christ. And, and you, you, it is the text that massages their hearts. And you help them put those clothes on. And I think sometimes, as a pastor, I've got to view a message, or the whole message, maybe over a three-week period. Yeah. Rather than that one shot, that Sunday, and the services, and then you move on. So, yeah. Let's, can we talk about evangelism in the local church? It's another, it's another one of um, Mark's. It's one, another one of Mark's Marks. Marky Mark. Yeah, Marky Mark's Marks. And uh, you, but you have, you have built that out. You've done other uh, books on biblical evangelism. Could you tell me a little bit about what you mean when you say, I'd love to see biblical evangelism as a, uh, an important uh, priority in every local church? Yeah, I'm just trying to clarify the lens on what we as, uh, as church leaders and Christians think of when we think of evangelism. Yeah. I think sometimes we think apologetics is evangelism, and I don't think apologetics is evangelism. I think apologetics is very important, but I don't think it's evangelism necessarily. I don't think sharing your testimony is evangelism. I think it can include the gospel, but it very easily can just be your sort of faith experience that particularly in today's culture, nobody's going to object to. Uh, So there are a number of other things. I don't think the results of evangelism are evangelism. If you're in a more revivalistic part of evangelicalism, uh, sometimes evangelism can get confused with just the results that you see of evangelism. I love Jim Packer's book, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God. You know, I, I think that what we do when we evangelize is we give the good news. 
and it's, it's up to God, the Holy Spirit, who responds. It's not that we don't care who responds. We desperately care who responds. That's why we're giving our lives to do what we do. But we know that it's, it's God that gives the growth. You know, First Corinthians, it's, it's God that gives life. And so what we do is have the glorious privilege of giving the message out, and then it's really over to the Lord and then what, what's going to happen with it. Do you uh, tend to uh, encourage the, uh, a particular mode for doing that? I mean, are you... Do you say, well, it doesn't matter whether the minister um, gives people the good news and everyone brings their friends to hear it, or it, that, that, that's fine, and it's also fine if, if the people are trained to do, to sit down in Starbucks and to share the gospel with somebody by reading through parts of the book of Mark. Do you, do you, do you, does that matter to you, or do you, do you say that's, biblical evangelism just has to happen, but the mode is up to you, or do you suggest things? Not kind of the mode is up to you, but I, I think, my guess is we'd all three agree it needs to happen from the pulpit, and in, in, in for one reason, just as an example, to teach the congregation. Yes. But then it secondly, it also needs to happen just daily in the lives of the congregation scattered. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's, that's a leadership principle, too, because at the end of the day, spiritual leaders are the desired destination at which other people need to arrive. And so, you know, if I'm shepherding my people, I mean, I've got to model evangelism, I've got to do evangelism, it has to be a part of who, who I am. In that sense, it's incarnational. But there is, there is a, philo- a biblical philosophy of ministry that comes into play here, too. Because our role, Ephesians 4, is to equip the body and to prepare them, to empower them, to release them. And so I think the training and mobilizing and creating a a movement, multiplying environment represents the Great Commission. And that's where we need to push the people to go. And Crawford, something that's fascinating about you is for 27 years you did that as part of a movement. I know Crusade is very big on thinking of themselves as a movement. But for some reason, you decided now to see the local church as where the Lord was calling you, and yeah. you've just described it as what you want to see in the local church as a movement. Yeah, well, it, the, here's where it comes together. Uh, first of all, on a personal level, I've always been a churchman, even when I was on staff of Crusade. And uh, sometimes, uh, not to sound defensive about Crusade, but sometimes Crusade gets a bad, a bad rap because of a few Scud Missile staff. Uh, you know... It, it, so you, you, tend to, you tend to make a caricature of the whole deal. By and large, the staff are, are really passionate about the church and about the local church and this kind of thing. Now, um, as, a, as a pastor, though, I felt called. Part of my move from <coughs> Campus Crusade to the local church was two things. Number one, just a growing passion in my heart to shepherd the people of God. And number two... To, to, really, to really live out in a local church what it really means to be God's movement in the world, to see that happen. And I think at that point, whether it's InterVarsity or Campus Crusade for Christ or any other parachurch agency, if they, have, if they have the view of the Great Commission right, it works there and it also should work in the local church because it's the heart of God. So do you have a particular kind of personal evangelism you try to make sure people at Fellowship Bible are trained in? No, I love the way you put it a few moments ago. You know, uh, Campus Crusade for Christ used the four laws, and now that we're using knowing God, and there's all kinds of techniques. But you've got to be careful that you don't market the technique as the gospel necessarily. It is the cross. And so there, we, we, have, we have various strategies in our church, various strategies. And the only thing that we keep our eyes on as elders and leaders to make sure that those strategies center around the cross, the clarity of the cross, man's alienation from God, the need for faith and repentance. That's the core of our message. Yeah. We, yeah, sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, in Crusade, I always got the impression, the, the, staff, the, the staff give you the impression if you're involved with Crusade, that everybody is a, a, an evangelist. You are, we are all evangelists. And I wondered whether when you got into the church, you found that the attitude was different, that uh, most of the folks don't expect, that, that most, most church members don't really consider that that's uh, the expectation for them. Yeah, your observation is a thousand percent right. It's, it is absolutely true that, you know, um, most people in the church are just trying to figure out how to make life work. They don't view themselves necessarily as evangelists. They know if they, if they have an authentic relationship with Christ, everybody's somewhere in there concerned about 
the condition spiritually of their neighbors or that kind of thing. But I, people don't view themselves that way. Uh, one of the biggest jobs that I had to get used to is that as a pastor, you're constantly working on thinking and perspective and how people view themselves and helping them with vision and coming alongside of them and lifting their sights, seeing the nobility of mission and how the nobility of mission affects their daily lives. So a lot of that is work you would have to do from the pulpit. You have to do it the pulpit. You know, you've got to over-communicate it from the pulpit. You've got to stress it from the pulpit. And uh, you've got to bleed over that. And, uh, and so that creates an environment for it to happen. Tim, the evangelistic culture of Redeemer? Well, I'm, um, well, let me ask you a question, and I'll, I promise to answer what you just said. You, you read The Trellis and the Vine, of course. Don't you recommend it on the back or something? Yeah. It's an Australian book. Um, and um, it's, it, when I read it, I was struck by the, well, put it this way. The, our, in the earlier days of Redeemer, the first number of years of Redeemer, there was an, uh, uh, there was an extremely powerful evangelistic dynamic. I, I think it's fair uh, in Lovelacean terms to say we had a revival for a while. Um, and um, just like, just like uh, Charles Spurgeon probably saw uh, more people converted in his ministry from 1857 to 1860 than he saw the rest of his life put together, in spite of the fact he became a better preacher as time went on. Um, I'm a little bit in that situation where I, I don't see the evangelist dynamic quite as strong as it used to be. In spite of the fact that you get bigger and the re- in, in, in actual numbers of people getting converted, it looks great. But you know that... Um, you know, now you have 3,000 people, you might say, producing as many conversions as 300 used to con- produce. Um, when I read that book, I said, uh-oh, that's, that's a pretty good approximation of what was going on in our earlier days. It's not going on as much now. Um, and for those of you, I'm not, I hate to, you hate to push any one book since... Um, as, as a magic bullet, and it's not, actually. In fact, it's, I think that book is criticizable on a couple of fronts, and I've seen it criticized. It, it does seem to me, in a, some way, to downplay a little bit the importance of the preaching, and even, and even the importance of community, it seems. But nevertheless, the basic idea there is that it's the job of the pastor to have an evident godliness about him that... Uh, give some credibility with a significant percentage of the people in the church that you can call lay ministers. He has a pastoral connection with them that uh, does have content in it. You do want to train people, but the relationship is almost as important as the content in empowering and emboldening lay people to do a variety of ministry in their daily lives. What I liked about the book is it started very, very very low down. It said, for example, do you talk to non-Christian friends and do you let them know you go to church? I mean, that was behavior one. Do you just, do you just mention that you go to church to your non-Christian friends and neighbors? That's a pretty low level, but a lot of people wouldn't even do that. The next one would be uh, perhaps that you, <clears throat> you say something positive about your church involvement. You just say, I get so much out of church. You know, then the, the next three, third one might be you ask other people something about what they believe. You know, it, it goes on up and when you have, frankly, if you have 10 to 20 percent or so of your congregation in that kind of close enough pastoral connection where uh, because of your training of them, because of your love of them, because of your giving them the vision to do it, and because they feel that they can get you on the phone if they have a question, they can, they can get, they can, they, they feel like they'll be supported by you, they're basically out there doing ministry of the word, lay ministry of the word, which is simply sharing their faith. But it's not just evangelism. It's, of course, it's also just encouraging other people and counseling and so on. And I read that. I said, you know, um, in spite of my pushbacks in a number of places, that's probably the dynamic I've seen in churches where there was this vigorous, a, a lot of conversions, a lot of vigorous activity. Yeah. I call, are you here? Call Marshall's been here. He's doing a workshop later today. Well, Colin Marshall is the author, and Tony Payne, you can get it in the bookstore, Trellis and Vine, Matthias Media from Australia, did this really good book. It is. If you haven't seen it. But what, what about some other parts of the evangelistic culture at Redeemer? I mean, what are there, so like Crawford was talking about things that they use. Uh, are there programs, particular programs that you all developed or that well, you've utilized? Or Yeah, I actually, 
I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something about that, but I actually don't think that they're the key. Because I do remember that in some ways, we, we started eventually to develop some really cool things that we've done in the way of evangelism, but they were, they were sort of after the fact. It was, it was when there was already this evangelism dynamic that, that, that you, you hardly even can call evangelism. It's really pastoral connection, godliness, spiritual growth. You, know, it's, it's, you, you believe that, don't oh, yeah. you? I mean, we would talk about a culture of evangelism, a culture of discipling, where we just make it right. known. I mean, the phrase I use again and again is, look, if you call yourself a disciple of Jesus and you're not helping other people follow Jesus, I just don't know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not attacking you. Right. I'm just saying, yeah. I, you know, help me understand that. Right. Jesus gave his life for others. So if you're not evangelizing or discipling, I'm, not, I'm just not sure what you sure. mean when you call yourself a disciple. Yeah, and I think, you know, we can quickly lose sight of the fact that the church is a dynamic organism. And there's a, there's, there's a point at which when we so segment and a la carte what we do in terms of our approach to ministry, that can absolutely work against us because, you know, wherever there's the life of God, the dynamic of the Holy Spirit in my heart and life, and uh, we're walking in the power and fullness of the Spirit of God, obeying His truth, nurturing people, our sensitivities to God and our sensitivity to lost people, it's right there. And so, you know, the training is a great tool. We need all these things. But I actually think we spend far too much time on the how-to rather than on the heart issues. Yeah, I think as a pastor, what I, what I want to see in the congregation is exactly, Tim, what you were talking about, about a sort of culture of evangelism, a culture of discipleship like that. And, and I think if, if, uh, if we can see that happen in our churches, we can give them any one of a number of good tools, and they'll use them. Yeah. So the tools aren't the key. I think the tools are helpful. So I'm, I'm happy to plug some tools. No, but it's the will to do it. In the, yeah. So Christianity Explored, if you haven't looked at Christianity Explored, let me encourage you to go look at that in the bookstore yeah. if they have it there. Or Christianity Explained, the slightly shorter, older version of that, which is what we often use, uh, six studies through Mark's Gospel. Two Ways to Live, also from Australia, just a straight-up gospel presentation. I love the way they, they start that one. It's, these are some good, simple tools that I would certainly commend to folks. Uh, and also, Tim, yeah. one more thing that I think you're preaching is a good example of. When we preach, we are modeling how to speak to non-Christians for all the Christians who are there. So not only is there the evangelistic potential, evangelistic potential for the non-Christians who are sitting there at the time, and that's wonderful, but beyond that, for the hundreds, or in their cases, thousands of people who are listening to them preach, there is the way you model when you, when you address the Christian, or even or rather the non-Christian, yeah. or when you show how to frame an issue and talk with, talk with the Christians about it. Uh, yeah, and, let me, and now that we've, we've told you, it's not the tools, it's the will, it's the, it's the culture. However, here's a couple more. Um, one thing that we have done over the years, we do something called Christianity Uncorked. It's not that different than maybe what other people have done, where you, you bring your friends to a restaurant or a pub, you, have, uh, you let them know it's going to be talking about a subject. You have somebody give you a very, very short, probably 12 to 15 minute uh, talk about does, does religion uh, you know, lead to, does, does orthodox religion lead to holy war? Does it, you know, can a Christian be a good citizen? Or what about evil and suffering? And then there's 45 minutes of Q&A. Everybody, don't come unless you can bring a non-Christian friend. Pretty simple. The sort of thing you do in campus kinds of outreaches, but it's a, you see fruit. Uh, another thing is, we, 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 lately we've been calling it the well. The, what the well is, is you come to have a prayer meeting about non-Christian friends and family that you are praying for and that you're reaching out to. It's actually a way of creating that culture. What I like about it is a method and yet it helps create the evangelistic culture. So it's just a prayer meeting for people to talk about their, uh, uh, to pray for their friends. We've certainly, we have a prayer meeting on Sunday evening. So we have a kind of traditional church, as, as I guess you know, that Sunday morning, two-hour service, hour-long sermon, hour of singing and prayer, and before that, scripture reading. Sunday evening, we ask the congregation, the members to come back, and we give that uh, mainly to prayer. And one of the things that we'll have people do is, uh, I'll have one or two or three examples usually on a Sunday night, of evangelism. So I got an email today from a brother in the church who's starting an evangelistic Bible study at work. He wonders, can he share about it? Real briefly, 60 seconds on Sunday night, get us to pray for it. And so we'll do that. And if there's always being a model of that held yeah. up, not only are we praying, but we're also instructing while we pray. Yeah, we try to introduce evangelism in everything that we do. And that's that, uh, on our services on Sunday morning, 
we have intentionally, we have changed life stories um, uh, every, every Sunday. And it's not a can thing. It's just, you know, what God's done. And, uh, you know, the incarnational value of that, when people see that, it strikes, strikes their hearts. And so, yeah. And then we also, uh, in fact, this Saturday, we're going to be doing this thing. We do it every year. It's called uh, Roswell Day of Hope. There's a lot of poor and under-resourced people around, and we don't just do it once a year. We, we've started, in fact, uh, an organization, um, a coalition of about 20 churches that are c- committed to be mobilized to care for the poor and under-resourced, but we leverage that as evangelistic opportunities as well as giving a cup of cold water in Jesus' name. And so we try to get our people to think that everything that we do should drive us back to Jesus. I have a radical change to propose to you, Tim, but I don't know how much sure. more time no, we you got want to take. I, I'm, no, go ahead. You okay? I don't think we have to go on. You're, anymore you're, on kind, you're kind of a, a guru of what's going to happen in the future. Really? Yep. So, uh, well, you live in Manhattan, the coolest place on earth, and the rest of us just watch and see what's happening there, and then maybe it'll come to us later. So, I'm just curious, looking out into the future. We have high buildings, so you can see a lot. Uh, it's way. amazing. <laughs> and so, you know, places like Atlanta and D.C., we, like, we, yeah. we get on the phone and right. try to figure it out. But... I'm just wondering, looking forward, let's say you're in the year 2080, the Lord hadn't come back, evangelicalism is still going in the U.S., do you think we're going to have many living pastors? Living? Yeah. Wait a minute. Meaning? Well, I'm just assuming that, you know, as the multi-site thing has gone. Oh, that. And as videos thing has gotten bigger. I'm imagining. Wait, wait, wait. I'm, four, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining. I'm imagining this conversation between two friends <clears throat> in pulpit search committees in two different evangelical churches. All right. Hey, Tom. Here, you're considering a living guy. Yeah, we found one up in Wisconsin. We really like. Really? Now, I don't know those living ones. They can go bad on you. I don't know. You know. Well, what are you guys doing, Keller? I mean, you know, we think he's a you, classic. We've been. You, you know, we've got 30 years of his stuff on the video, and we're there's a lot of people who like Keller, and so I think we're going to. We had a church down in Florida had Keller for five or ten years. Really liked him. It was a good period for the church. <laughs> Is that what 2080 holds? <clears throat> I love it. Nah. <laughs> I, I, you know what? The, I think it, it this isn't be. a fair fight because I, 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 am, I am no more a, uh, I, I don't think I'm any more a fan of the uh, uh, multi-site through video than you are. So it's not going to work. We're not going to get any sparks here. I, I, and I also think that, I, you know, what is, quickly, what there, and this is not to judge anybody else, including other members of the coalition, um, a coalition. <laughs> but five or six years ago, but TGC I, listen, sounds so good. I had, listen, I, we had four services on a Sunday. We did. I preached the four services. That's about, and when we had to go to five on a Sunday, the question was, what are we going to do? Because Tim can't preach five. In fact, Tim can't preach four, <laughs> but he does. And so we actually, it was intriguing. As a, as, a, as a staff, we actually came up with the idea. I said, well, do we do the video thing? Now, it, we could have said, it's temporary because, after all, it's just one of the five, and, and Tim's of the other ones, and it would seem very mild. Uh, 110%, everybody said, no, that is not the future. So that just builds it around you. That's no way to raise up other preachers. And I was very, very glad, and that's how we went. So, I mean, and that, I know that's your view of it, too. And I, I actually do think that people don't like the, 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 um, the, the lack of, the, the huge distance between the preacher and, and, well, part of that, and, the, and, the, and the pew, as it were. Part was. of that's going to happen just through size. I mean, if you have 4,000 or 3,000 or even 1,000 or 800 people, it's not the same as having 20 people or 200 people. So just the sheer size does something about the distance between yes, <clears throat> no doubt. the pastor and Whether the Whether it's a video or not, yeah. no doubt about that. So, <clears throat> but with multi-site today, being, using video like it does, do you really think it's so far-fetched? I know I presented it humorously, but do you really think it's so far-fetched that uh, if, if the evangelical culture gets used to having a live guy to do the pastoral care stuff and they really benefit from this other guy's teaching by video, is it why, just like we have radio, we have Jim Boyce playing on the radio and, mm. you know, others. Really, do you think? Uh, well, my, my, I certainly want to hear what Crawford has to say on this, too. I, I, I do think it could go either way, unfortunately. I, 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 I do see a surprising number of folks who don't, 
it could be because they're used to seeing everything on a screen yeah. that this will not seem odd. Yeah. And therefore, it could be, I, I have some principled reasons why I don't like it. I gave you one of them. I really do think it, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's very, it serves the future generation of pastors very poorly. It, it just fails to raise up new leaders. It builds, there's a whole lot of reasons why I don't like it. Nevertheless, it still might, some of the reason might be because I'm not used to seeing everything on a screen. And therefore, in other words, my age might be, I'm just, I just recoil from it. Uh, but there's plenty of younger people that don't. And therefore, I think it could go either way. There is a backlash to some degree against huge churches, I think. But on the other hand, there's plenty of them doing well. But and so got, it could go either way. a little Baptist church in, in rural Georgia that doesn't really know uh, where to get a good pastor and some of the older members just loved Adrian Rogers when he was on TV and you know they, they figure out how you can stream Adrian Rogers into this big flat screen in the church. But you got to have a preacher who's a pastor. If it's a small church the person the church doesn't just need content. But they isn't that the same argument against a sort yeah. of you know. no, but in the old days you know plenty of small nonconformist chapels that didn't have the money for a pastor would read a sermon. True. They just read somebody That's would right. get up and read a sermon. Yeah. So it's not, and so I'm not, it's not, frankly, it's, it's there, you can't draw a bright line and say this is evil or this is a sin, this is not. And I, it's also possible we may go in that direction because of the way in which the direct, the way the direction of the culture is going, which is everything through technology instead of face to face. Um, I hope not though, I'm just, I'm on record to say I don't think it would be good. I don't. Yeah, I, I have different levels of, you know, I don't, I'm not binary about it, you know, meaning that I think, does it work? Yeah, it works. It works big time. Um, does it get numbers? Yeah, it gets numbers. Are people ministered to? Yes. Yes, they're ministered to. Uh, are there ways of being personal with it? Absolutely. They're, most of the people who are effective at multi-sites have, have campus pastors where the interaction is taking place. And so you just have the dude that you plug and play and he's on the screen. And so, you know, I don't know. I wouldn't fall on my sword over it. I'm sort of like you, Tim, with it. Uh, but there are larger questions that you have to answer. Here are the bigger questions in my mind that you have to answer. You've got to decide. There are two ways of building a ministry when, when it's all said and done. Two ways of building a church. You can either build it around the strengths and gifts of a personality. You can do that. Uh, someone has strong communication abilities. Or what, I, what I mean, you know, you guys up here have that. And you can, you can leverage that until the cows come home and build it that way. Um, and, you know, and it works all the time. Or you can build it around multiplication and New Testament discipleship where you intentionally raise up leaders. Sounds like you favor the latter. I favor the latter. Absolutely. Because even numbers wise, even numbers wise, over time, even numbers wise, uh, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be raising up leaders and it's going to look more like the New Testament, more like Paul's strategy. And so my question is not whether or not will it work or will it be effective, and we probably will have variations of that trend, but you always need leaders who deal with their significance issues and realize that they've got to invest in lives and prepare them for a time that you cannot see, give them a platform to serve, uh, and so the local church becomes that place where leaders are constantly kicked up. And so I think you, you drop your strategy within that, that, that greater principle and understanding, and that's, that's kind of where I'm at. Um, and I, here's another, since we're pushing back, um, it's also the end of dialogical preaching of any sort. Uh, we, we know, we're affected, when you're up there, that you see them, they see you, um, you are affected by them. If, if actually, even, even white people signal <laughs> to the preacher <laughs> in some ways, God, I'm going to hear the rest of this. Come on. Even white people signal. Bring it. <laughs> Even white people signal to the preacher um, whether they're with you or not, whether they're confused, whether they're moved, whether they're convicted. Uh, Non-white people sometimes are a little clearer about that yeah. uh, as they're listening. Uh, and the point is that it affects you because there actually is some kind of interaction going on. Absolutely. Which, and also, by the way, when I walk into one of my services tend to be a little more multi-ethnic and young. Other services are a little uh, less multi-ethnic and older. And I automatically can see who's out there and it does influence the way you're applying the text. And um, 
but if you're on a screen, you can't do that. It's all the interaction is cut off. Yeah, and 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 that's that's a huge thing you've lost there. Yeah, and I, I to, to add another line to that, you know, when you preach, the people need to feel your love for them, your love for God, and your love for them. And uh, and not to get too mystical about this, but I think the preaching moment, um, God has given you something to say, and you've got an appointment with God and His people for that moment. And it comes down this way to this way and this way to this way. And can you capture that on a CD? Yeah, you can. I mean, I've been moved by that. But I think when you look into a man's eyes that's standing up there with an open Bible, it's the window to his soul. And, uh, and that's, that's part of that whole spiritual dynamic that takes place during that moment. Why do you have your word of God open? Well, just because I was thinking about how, you know, we're not, <clears throat> we need, in Ephesians chapter 4, we need to see and be confident that it's Christ who gives gifts, uh, some to be pastors and teachers. So, you know, if we're in a church and we're wondering how are we going to get a good pastor, uh, we need a, a, a pastor, you need an under-shepherd, Christ will, will give it to us. Ultimately, this is his work, and we pray and trust he will be sufficient for what sure. we need. Yeah, I think, just to wrap up this part, because I do have one other question, I think, I'd like to get to. Uh, I think we're all, can you all see that even though we're in agreement, uh, we see more drawbacks than advantages to the idea of the video uh, preaching, but that we're really, uh, you know, there, we have other members of the coalition that that's a very important way in which they're getting the word out. Uh, we're certainly not drawing that bright line and saying, this is sin, this is not um, uh, there's all kinds of reasons why I would I could imagine myself doing it now. Yeah. I mean, if we have, there's all. I think everybody, for example, knows if suddenly there's this enormous persecution, and everybody's got to go underground, and uh, you know a certain percentage of your congregation can only get you over you know over their computer screen in on a Sunday morning for several weeks. Is that a sin? No. Go for it. Yeah, of course not. I mean, so. Yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of ways in which you can't say this is evil, this is a sin, this is not. And yet we think that in the end it's not a great trend. And we don't think it's the best. And we think, uh, I think at least we're in agreement that I, w I would not be happy about that trend in the future. But I think it's 50-50. It might go in that way, absolutely. Well, and as the most probably pronounced opponent to multi-site stuff, I just want to make it clear. I am so thankful when a brother is preaching the gospel. Uh, that I am, I am delighted to have it, even if it's on a screen. It wouldn't be my preference. I wouldn't think yeah. that's wisest for the church. But I am so thankful uh, that the gospel is being preached. Uh, my question w it might be good. Another one of uh, your nine marks has to do with membership. Uh, I noticed you asked uh, Crawford because some Bible churches don't have them. So it might be interesting for us to uh, just spend a little bit of time talking about what are, how you, uh, how you uh, incorporate members what membership is. I'm going to start with you because you've got it so well worked out. And I know we're not all going to be the same on this, but I'm interested. Yeah, well, I think we're going to be pretty similar. I mean, basically, we expect people, if they're coming regularly, we teach them you want to be a member of a church. So we, we take it that as a basic part of Christian discipleship. If you won't join us, that's fine. Then you need to go join a gospel preaching church where you will join. We want them officially under the authority of a body of elders. Uh, now, how we do that in our class, or in our church, we have a six-week class, so six one-hour sessions they go to. At the end of that, they have an interview with an elder uh, and somebody else where we go over their understanding of the gospel, and most of the time just on their own life history. Um, <clears throat> ask them for some very specific questions. Um, if they're coming from another local church, that'll cause a little bit more questions, try to find out about that. Uh, if they just come to Christ, uh, then we would talk to them about, um, you know, basics of the Christian life. Mm -hmm. Uh, then that uh, report of that interview would go to an elders meeting, the next elders meeting. Then if the elders are thumbs up on it, it goes to the next members meeting, which we do six times a year, so every other month. That members meeting, they're not present, but an elder then would just represent a picture will come up. The elder would represent briefly their testimony, and then there would be a motion to accept, and then uh, the congregation would vote. Okay. Well, uh, but, uh, what do you cover in those six one-hour sessions? Just uh, we, yeah, uh, statement of faith of the church, church covenant, that's how we'll live together. So statement of faith, what we believe, church covenant, how we will live. Um, then we do one on why join a church, because a lot of churches don't stress that, so explaining that. And then uh, how we do sort of missions, evangelism, church life, and various nuts and bolts about church history and how we fit into the flow. Mm. Uh, has Fellowship Bible Church always had membership? No. 
Okay. Did you, did it, did you incorporate it when you got there, or was well, it? Well, it was quasi incorporated just before I got there, and then we uh, we we strengthened that. And ours was, you know, this sounds negative, but it's ultimately positive. Membership relates to accountability and church discipline too. Yeah. Oh yes. And and you know you 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 get people who are not accountable, and yet they've been coming to a church for five, ten, fifteen years. You know, it's, they're flying underneath the radar, and you can't help them. You just can't help them, and so uh, we're, we're not we're not real rigid in our process, but we we do we do a, a preview, and uh, we've instituted this. We do a preview and what we're all about, where we tell them our vision, our direction, what we're our doctrine, and this kind of thing. And then there is a there is a um, uh, a half day session that uh, they they sign up for on a Saturday or so, and they go through um, you know our doctrinal statement in more detail and our vision statement in more detail what we're all about and where we're going and this kind of thing free to ask any questions and then we have we do the same thing we have uh, interviews with uh, some of our leaders and uh, we we don't we don't do the vote thing um, so who, who who approves them the person that interviews them gives the final recommendation and that's an elder yeah an elder or uh, an elder or another spiritual leader that's an, an equivalent in our church. Well, not, no one's equivalent to an elder, but another leader in our church. And, uh, and then at, at that point, you know, we, we embrace them. Yeah, we're uh, more like you, even though we're Presbyterian. We would have, um, uh, actually, I realize that we're behind. I'm, I'm going to have to keep up with the Baptists. I think we only have five hours, not six. So this, is, uh, this vexes me. Uh, <laughs> As, as Commodius says, I'm very vexed. Um, so, uh, however, we do very, very similar. Um, and that is, there'll be about five hours. There's also uh, only a couple things to add, I think. Uh, we have elder interviews, the elders interview, and then the elders vote on, on bringing people in. Because we're Presbyterian Church, we don't have the uh, congregation vote. What, however, what about 2 Corinthians 2.6? Uh, remind me, uh, oh brother. <laughs> it just Paul, you know, they've they've disciplined the Corinthian church has disciplined that guy, and maybe it's talking about the guy in First Corinthians five. Yeah. We don't know, but then he specifically tells them uh, that the punishment inflicted on him by the plenum, the majority, right. is sufficient for him. Well, I think actually discipline. Uh, we, when we have done discipline, th- th- frankly, uh, bringing someone in, we consider something that the elders should do. But but uh, drumming somebody out, we think, is not something just the elders should do, unless it's uh, with there's some good reasons. We think we think the discipline should be as notorious as the sin. That's in our book of church order. Uh, it depends on how notorious the sin is. So uh, maybe our maybe our Presbyterian Church book of George order is uh, at variance with Second Corinthians, and I may better maybe better take a look at it. Thank you for that. Uh, that that's why you're my friend. I appreciate that. Uh, the the one thing that you might find interesting. Um, oh, one thing is we recently incorporated the idea of getting all of the the classes online. So in other words, we recorded the classes, and so it's possible to to. Come That's get it live. Well, now, you know what we're going to do, though? Here's, this just shows how suspicious we are. We're pretty excited about it. It means you can watch it, and then you come in for your interview. Um, but we're also going to monitor whether we think that the people are learning it as well. In other words, if uh, we're going to, we're, not that we assume that they won't. We don't assume that. But we're going to try to, uh, recently we said, can we find a way of, inc- of, of comparing how well the interviews went with the people who were in a, they're live and the people who got it over the internet, I mean, who, who were able to watch it online. Um, because if we find that they're not learning it as well online, then that we might do something about it. But nevertheless, the only other thing is, we, there's, a, there's a bit of a, when we talk to people about membership, uh, it's a bit of a tongue-in-cheek way of putting it. Uh, sometimes I teach like this. I said, what are the benefits of membership? I mean, if you join, it, this is America, so you, what benefits, if you do something, what are the benefits? What are the benefits of membership? Now, from one point of view, as people are trying to come up with them, a lot of people, they, they struggle. And at a certain point, I like to say, guess what? I don't know that there are any benefits to membership. I mean, church discipline is a benefit, but most Americans don't see it that way. But we, it is a benefit. We, we found young people in the interviews do see it that way. Well, it, it's, it's fair to say that 
from an American consumer point of view, membership doesn't make much sense. That's all I want. And uh, sometimes you need to confront that to say, it could be the reason why you are dragging your feet about membership or you're unenthusiastic about membership is you've been very, very, very influenced by the culture because you're just saying, what do I get out of, what can I get out of the church that I can't get? I mean, mostly membership means you get special deals. If you're a member of Sam's Club, you can get the, you know, the membership rate. If you're a member of the club, then we allow you to, if you're a member of the Museum of Natural History, then you get this. And most people think of membership like that, which is a consumer thing. I, here's a fee that you pay, and that gives us membership fees, but then you get these benefits uh, from the fee, and you think they're valuable. It doesn't work like that. A church membership is not like any other kind of membership. And, uh, but of course there are enormous benefits and you have to say, not probably the, the, in, the, in the most intuitive way to you, but church discipline is a huge, huge uh, benefit. What is that, my friend? Well, this would be the membership directory of the Capitol Hill Baptist Church. I've found, uh, I've found having a membership directory one of my best tools pastorally. So if you guys don't have one, I would encourage you. So, we have uh, everybody's uh, picture and contact information so that when you come to an interview, we have the picture taken. Take and love offerings great, too. It's a, it's a, well, it's a, it's a prayer list. So we encourage members to agree to pray through it regularly. We update it every couple of weeks. Good. It's a very useful pastoral tool. I want you to know that Crawford and I also carry around our membership directory. We left it off stage. Just right right. Around. <laughs> that we would, we would never be found without it. Right, Crawford? No, it's, it's in our hearts. It's right, right. <laughs> Oh, so wait, I forgot, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Crawford memorizes his, which even is better than what Mark has done. Mark has, doesn't Carries even, his he doesn't Bible. know his people well enough, he has to carry it around. Hey, time's up, it's been three, it's been a whole hour of talking about what the local church should look like, and I hope you have a little better idea, because I'm not sure I do, but uh, I want to, I want to thank me. <laughs> I want to thank Mark and Crawford, who are really good friends, and I, I all hope your, your local church will be better if you have friends like I have friends, who are other pastors who have been wrestling and thinking about this for a long time, and that's why your local church will become more like what Jesus wants it to be. Amen. So uh, you're dismissed. Thanks for coming.